All right, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us for this talk this morning for the second day of GovCon 2021. And glad you could join us for this discussion about what to do with your great idea for a Drupal module, how you can bring it to life and get it adopted by the Drupal community. My name is Martin Anderson Klutz on Drupal.org and various social platforms. I go by ManClue. I'm a solutions engineer at Acquia, and I've done some uh, Drupal and other certifications. Wanted to level set about this talk. So it's really based on my own experience. I can't guarantee that, you know, following the same sort of uh, approaches that you'll have the same experience that I did, but would definitely be interested in having some discussions if there are uh, people at the talk that, you know, have had different experiences, uh, maybe other suggestions in terms of, uh, helpful approaches. The talk is intended to help you better define what your module should do and why it's really not uh, meant to be sort of how to write code. It's going to be a resource guide. So as you'll see going through the slide deck, there are links throughout. So I'll make the slides available afterwards and you'll be able to sort of download that and, you know, um, use the links to as a sort of reference guide for, you know, where to find some of these things uh, within the Drupal community. The, the last bullet here is the closest you're going to come to seeing any code within this presentation. It's really about right. writing code. There was an excellent talk yesterday by Mike Madison, one of the GovCon organizers, uh, who did a talk about writing code and specifically things like uh, following code standards. So uh, by all means, uh, I would recommend if you didn't catch that one to, uh, to go back and review it when the videos are released. So hopefully you already have the, the big idea. So it's the, whether it's, you know, an itch that you need to scratch for a, a project you need to work on, or maybe it's um, something you're, you're really um, passionate about and you want Drupal to be able to do. Um, really starting up work on a module should start with, with a big idea. And, and I like to try and clarify it in terms of thinking about what's really the problem that you're trying to solve. Because I think if you can, can really be clear about that, that's really going to help both in terms of um, how you sort of plan and execute the module, how you'll be able to talk to other people about it, and yes, we along that we come to that idea of really uh, that clear understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. You should also think about Jacob's Law. So Jacob Nielsen was one of the founders of the Nielsen Norman Group and really a pioneer of website usability. And his law is that when people arrive at your website, they they come after having already visited thousands of other websites. And so they're going to have a bunch of expectations and mental models about how a website should work. And so while it's good to be innovative sometimes, you should also have a clear understanding of what are the relevant mental models that people are going to have relative to the thing that you're trying to do. So um, again, it's, it's not a bad idea to, to sort of try and, and um, you know, bend some of those rules sometimes, but um, understand that the more that you make things unfamiliar, the more that you're going to need to, you know, um, provide some kind of, you know, documentation or instruction. And of course, we also know that that people are usually reluctant to actually have a website. So again, the more you can follow those mental models, the more that's going to help you. Also, may want to think about a distinction I like to make between modules that are toolkits versus solutions. So. A toolkit is something like uh, the, the views module or even something more obscure like, you know, image API optimized that, that provide excellent functionality, uh, but really require a site builder to install and configure them before they're going to be useful. Whereas a solution is something that can provide value kind of more out of the box. Uh, so think about something like the editorially um, accessibility scanner that you can install and immediately on your site, you'll start to see feedback in terms of you know, any accessibility issues you might have. So um, there's no right or wrong answer, um, but there, there may be an opportunity to, to kind of do both depending on the approach that you're going to take. So uh, maybe consider that as well. Now, the next step that I like to take is, is not required, but I always like to, to try and do uh, kind of a quick proof of concept if I can. So the idea is to, to sort of take the very core of the idea that you want to execute and put together a really small implementation of that to, to really just sort of test uh, the basic functionality. So as an example, a couple of years ago, when I first started getting into writing uh, Drupal 8 modules, 
I had an idea for a way to uh, manipulate solar search results. So I put together a quick proof of concept using, you know, the uh, search API solar query alter hook and uh, use the, the solar property that I thought would work. And so within a couple of hours, I had that, that working proof of concept and it, and it was cool to see that, you know, even just using those hard coded values, um, that the, the actual idea that I had was actually going to work. And at that point, um, it gives you a, a chance to test, you know, some of the, the approaches that you think are going to work. It gives you a chance to show it to other people and, and maybe get some feedback on it. And, and just in, that it can really be motivating to see that idea take shape and, and really feel like, you know, it's, it's kind of a living, breathing thing that, that it's something that you can sort of uh, continue to work on and, and bring forward. The next step is really to start to do a little bit of research because the last thing you want to do is to put a bunch of work into a module to find that there's already something out there that does something very similar. So do some research in terms of, you know, whether that existing module is actually out in the wild. Um, maybe there are modules that aren't identical to what you want to do, but they're, but they're pretty similar. You also may want to see if there's an existing library that you could use to get you part of the way to what you want to do. So maybe it's a, a PHP library, maybe it's a JavaScript library, uh, anything that, that can save you from, from having to build everything yourself, I would say is definitely worth considering. So you're going to want to do some search both within Drupal.org, uh, specifically for modules, but also I would say try using Google and also remember synonyms. So don't just use you know, if you wanted to make a module about events, don't just search for, you know, Drupal event module, but, you know, Drupal date module, Drupal, you know, calendar, uh, different things in the space can, can help you sort of uh, dig up those related modules. You also want to think about, it, does it actually need to be an entirely new module? Maybe it could be a feature you could add to an existing module. And so if there is that existing module that, that it could be added onto, you could open an issue in that module's issue queue and sort of raise it as a feature request, ask the maintainer if they'd be open to a patch or a um, pull release. And, and that can definitely save you time um, in terms of, of sort of, again, you know, sort of scratching your itch or what have you. Another step you might want to consider is if there's an analogous module you can use for reference. So as an example, when I was doing that module that I mentioned, I was trying to think about what's the best way to, to store the configuration in terms of, I wanted uh, admin users to be able to go in and create entries that would be used to manipulate those search results. And so I started thinking about how that was similar to how the way the redirect module works, right? It's, it's admins creating entries that then get used to um, impact or influence the anonymous experience. And so I saw that they were using uh, custom content entities, and, and that gave me a hint in terms of the approach that I can take with my module. Um, so again, thinking about existing modules that that use sort of a similar structure or approach can, can help you in terms of identifying um, successful models that are already in use. You can also look at, is there an abandoned project that you can take over? So there's a link here to a list of modules that had a Drupal 8 release, but have never been um, updated for Drupal 9 and didn't respond to a recent uh, query to, to get sort of automated patches committed. And so they've been officially listed as uh, abandoned, which means that you can take those over pretty easily. And that can be a good opportunity. Again, if the, uh, the existing module kind of marries up pretty well to what you want to do, uh, it gives you an existing code base to get started. Uh, it gives you an existing user base of people who um, are going to be interested to sort of try out your new version. So uh, definitely something to consider there. Next, you're going to want to start to sort of plan out exactly how are you going to build out this module. So start to think about things like what functionality are you going to need? You might try using or creating user stories. And a good template for user stories is as a blank user, I want to blank so that blank. So the, the key thing is not just the, the functional piece, but also understanding who it's for, who's going to be using it, and also the kind of underlying motivation. Because if you can put all of those three things together, you're going to be able to deliver the functionality in kind of a more um, cohesive way and a way that, that, that doesn't just sort of you know, give them the base functionality, but, but really create a better experience for, for those users. Also start to think about what things should be configurable. 
Um, that will probably evolve over time, but even some initial planning will help in terms of things like, you know, uh, what configuration your module is going to need to store. You should think about um, existing functionality. So are there things in Drupal core or maybe in other contrib modules that you can use as sort of like a class to extend? Uh, maybe they have API hooks that you can use. Um, again, leveraging existing code, I would say, is, is definitely a time saver, both in terms of uh, the initial creation of your module, but then also in terms of kind of maintenance and, uh, you know, technical debt over time. Also start to think a little bit about what your module is going to need to store. So again, it, you may have uh, kinds of entities, configure content entities that you know you're going to store. It's possible that you're going to want to uh, interact directly with sort of custom database tables, but I would say in kind of a modern Drupal infrastructure, more often than not, you're probably going to be looking at storing things as entities. So at this point, you should also be trying to think about where you could get some help. If you have a local Drupal users group, I would say definitely try and be active in there. Reach out and see if there are people who are willing to, you know, give you a little bit of, of help, maybe even some mentorship. Um, because having those local connections, I find, definitely increases the chances of, of finding somebody who's going to be motivated to help you. There is also Drupal Slack, and in particular, there's a channel called Module Development. You can reach out in there and see if there are, you know, people who can help you get over specific questions. There's a weekly meeting run by Dave called Contrib Half Hour. Um, there's a link here to the Drupal Auto page for it. And that can be a good forum for, you know, if you want to talk through the approach of what you're trying to take, if you hit a specific roadblock, um, there's a good chance you'll be able to get kind of a, a nudge in the right direction there. There are obviously a variety of different online forums. There's a Drupal specific stack exchange. And so you can definitely post issues there in terms of specific um, stumbling blocks you've run into. I would encourage you to be as specific as possible when you do that. So if there's a um, specific function section of code that is giving you problems, I would say include that in the issue. If there's a specific error you're getting, include that as well. Um, really, the more specific you can be, the more likely you are to get some help. And finally, if you have the opportunity, either again through you know, maybe your, your local Drupal user group or maybe somebody you've met um, on Slack, maybe somebody you've met at a conference like this one um, who's willing to act as a collaborator, I would say definitely, definitely take that up because um, having somebody who can be even just a fresh set of eyes on things for reviewing code, for doing things like uh, helping you to test the, the functionality. I always find when, when somebody new takes some, uh, a module that I've done and can put it through its paces, um, they're much more likely to find kind of issues that, um, that I haven't seen before because oftentimes I'll think about a module in a specific way of how you should use it. And um, that's not to say that it can't be used in other ways. So again, having that fresh set of eyes is, is really going to be helpful. Now, with all of that done, hopefully you're ready to jump in and start to actually write some code. And the great thing about working on an open source project like Drupal is that even the tools are free. So you can download VS Code and get that set up. Um, there's a link to a page here on Drupal.org that talks about all of the different kind of extensions you can install to make that optimized for Drupal. And it's really to, to really understand the Drupal coding standards. And um, they're important because they really, especially when you think about going back to, to get uh, help and, you know, uh, issues that you might raise, some of those things even have people in the community who are eventually going to want to, you know, write patches for bug fixes or to help you um, add features to your module. If you've got a lot of coding standards in there, it's, there's a much higher chance that they're going to get hung up on um, seeing where those coding standards issues are, as opposed to really being able to look deeper into the, the underlying problems in your code. So um, try to adhere to coding standards as you go. Again, that talk uh, by Mike Madison yesterday is a really good reference for uh, understanding you know, different approaches for adhering to coding standards. He talks in a lot more depth about those, so I uh, would recommend reviewing that. Um, but Lint as you go, so uh, ideally even, you know, before you get any code to your uh, Git repo, um, check that for code standards. Also consider writing automated tests for your module. So 
Automated tests are a great way to make sure that as you continue to make changes and add new features to your module, that you're not sort of breaking any existing functionality, you know, causing any kinds of regression. So I uh, definitely would encourage that as well. And again, as, as early and as often as you can get feedback, definitely take people up on that because um, I always like to say the sooner you can course correct, the less effort that's going to take. So if there's something that's fundamentally off about the way that you're trying to do something, then, um, you know, the sooner you can find that out, the, the quicker and easier it's going to be to, to make some of those changes. So hopefully now you've got um, at least an initial set of code and you're ready to actually get something posted to Drupal.org. So there's a link here to a page that describes the process of actually creating that uh, project node. I would encourage you to start as a sandbox. Um, you can create a full project later. Um, definitely good to, to get some code posted, maybe iterate a few times and get it tested before you actually go to a full project. Again, um, you know, promoting to a full project is, is something I usually try and make sure I've got the code as close to, you know, ready by uh, coding standards, Drupal coding standards as possible. So uh, a good reminder uh, to do it at that step as well. And also there's a link here to the README template on Drupal.org. Uh, README is really important in terms of letting people who want to install your module understand what's the process to get it kind of uh, installed and configured. Now, the next step is really to also populate the content that should go on that project page. There's a link here to a set of uh, suggestions for the content of that page. But I would say, again, really try and focus on describing the problem that your module is trying to solve. Uh, you can also describe any of the key features of the modules, the way that, um, it's really going to uh, make someone's website better. Also, include any information about similar modules that you found and in particular how yours is different. So that can really help people who are having in that specific problem that they're trying to solve to understand which one is going to be the best solution for their specific use case. In terms of images on this project page, I usually like to, to create a little bit of a fun logo for uh, the projects that I create. It's definitely not a requirement, but if it's something that you want to do, there may be you know, either someone you know, a friend of a friend, a friend of someone in your local Drupal users group who would be willing to take a little bit of time and help you out with that. There might be a local community college that would be interested in taking that on as like a student uh, project. Um, there are also even like online resources. So you could go to like a Fiverr or there are websites specifically for generating logos. So um, not a requirement, but lots of different ways uh, to create one if, if that's something you're interested in. I also usually like to include screen captures so that you can kind of show visually some of those key features. And now you should be ready to start creating releases. Um, releases are, are basically taking a snapshot of the code and, and telling kind of the Drupal community that your module is ready to use. And I would en encourage you to take the approach for your releases of trying to do a small number of things really well. And then as you get those kind of you know, tested and polished and stable, um, create a release and then start on kind of the next feature. So rather than trying to do everything, but then having lots of bugs, I would say it's much better to uh, try to do a smaller number of things and uh, roll those re uh, the feature set out uh, over time. Also, you should really be trying to get to a stable release as quickly as possible. Again, um, you know, using that smaller set of features, getting those stable, do a stable release, and then you can do even um, like beta releases for additional features as they get ready to uh, release to the community. Also, as you think about how to roll out those features, I would encourage you to listen to you know feedback in terms of issues that get posted to your project. Um, there's always lots of different use cases that people have, and, and they may suggest really interesting features that, that you hadn't even thought of. And so I would say incorporating that kind of feedback into your roadmap is really going to be helpful. Now, there's some resources here in terms of the process for actually tagging a release and getting it uh, created within Drupal.org. There's a page here about understanding when to use kind of an alpha, beta, or release candidate release. Uh, a reference for understanding semantic versioning. So when to use kind of a major version, a release version, or a, um, a bug release version. 
And finally, um, how the process is for getting to opt into security coverage. Now you should be at a point where you're ready to sort, sort of kind of let the, the community know about your module and, and really try and promote it a little bit. So the weekly drop is an amazing resource. That's the, the weekly Drupal newsletter. Um, I would say if you're going to go that route of trying to, to get it into the weekly drop, wait until it's stable, or at least you've got a pretty solid beta release. The last thing you want is for somebody to try out your module for the first time and find that it's really buggy. Maybe it actually like white screens their site or, or something, you know, pretty serious that way, because then there's a higher chance that they'll kind of uninstall it right away and maybe never want to use it again. So try and avoid that. Also writing a blog about your module can be a great way to get the word out. It gives you a chance to sort of uh, tell in a really just again, what, what's the problem that your module is trying to solve, talk about those key features, even show them also uh, with screenshots, um, and really just talk in depth about, um, you know, the module and, and why you think it's going to be, you know, a great addition to someone's website. You can also get involved in Slack channels that are relevant to your module. So again, if your module is for, you know, something related to managing events, there's um, a variety of different Slack channels are, uh, related to that. So there's, you know, event organizers, there's daytime, there's a couple of others. So um, try and listen to some of the conversations and see if they seem relevant. If if you have an opportunity to to hear someone who has a problem that your your module is, is trying to solve, then then you get the chance to sort of spread the word about your module, but also genuinely give them help, which I think is, is kind of the best case scenario. Um, there may be other ways to to find people with a problem you're you're trying to solve or your module is trying to solve. So again, if it's uh, using that events example, um, there may be people who weren't even using Drupal but are event um, organizers in your local community, and maybe there's some kind of a meetup where you could uh, talk to them and and understand ways that uh, your module could better suit some of the things they're trying to do, and and again have a dialogue around around what it is that you're trying to do, and then. I'll doing presentations like this one. So Drupal users groups and camps love to have new content um, and in particular from new presenters. So, um, you know, I would say reach out, um, make a session uh, suggestion and then um, get started putting together your presentation. And then the last piece is really around maintainership. So once you've got your module released to the world, once you've got people using it, um, really your work shouldn't be done. Um, maintainership is, is a key part of the, kind of the overall life cycle of your module. So um, really try and in time uh, every so often to, to make sure that it's being kind of maintained. You want to try and be responsive. Um, you know, in particular, if somebody has kind of a, of a critical issue, make sure you can respond right away, even if it's just to sort of clarify, like, you know, what version of Drupal are you using, what version of the module, what other modules are you using? Um, sometimes I think just that that um, quick response can be really helpful in terms of helping people to feel like they you know they haven't just installed this module and now their site is broken. Also, it's important to uh, periodically make new releases. So, you know, as uh, people kind of create patches or um, there may be different issues that have um, new features, some of those kinds of things. As a as a site owner. It, I find it can be kind of a little bit discouraging if you keep using the same module and eventually you have like eight different patches that you need to, to get it to work uh, reliably within your site. So having a new release that, that incorporates some of those and, and kind of helps to keep the module moving forward is, is definitely helpful. I would also encourage you to write documentation. Um, I know for myself, I find as soon as I start to, to answer the same question more than once, then, then usually that means that that should probably be a documentation page. It, it will help your users to um, self-service, to kind of, you know, find their own solution more quickly. And it also saves you from, again, having to answer some of those same questions again and again. And finally, if you have the ability to collaborate, um, that's usually a much better approach than trying to sort of, you know, reinvent the wheel, re-implement something that's already existing. So. You know, if there is a, a module that does something similar to what you were thinking you wanted your module to be able to do, maybe reach out and see if uh, the two of you can can make those modules work together. So usually the approach I like to take is to open an issue in the 
it was just issue queue to say, hey, it would be great to, to get two modules to work together. I'll link to an issue in my own issue queue. Um, and then that way, each of those can, can sort of capture the work that's needed to make them work together. And uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is really that um, for myself, I find that this process of, of uh, maintainership and, and sort of thinking about the roadmap for modules can, can actually be one of the most satisfying parts of, of you know, working on modules and, and being um, active in the community this way. In my day-to-day -day work, oftentimes, you know, how, how a, a website is going to be implemented is really something that you know, the customer is really dictating. They're the ones who sort of sign the checks and so they have the final say. Whereas when I'm maintaining a module, I get to make a lot of those decisions. And so I can say, that sounds great. Um, you might say, I don't really have time for that, but would love your patch if you have, if you can put one together. Um, or you might say, you know, that thing, but I don't think it's, it necessarily needs to, to be part of this module. And maybe you can say, give them some sense of how they could create that as an add-on module. Maybe you could implement an API so that they could create that as, you know, uh, a module that could be implemented as, as kind of an extra <clears throat> or an outside piece. Um, but again, it's, it, it gives you, I think, a lot more sort of freedom and autonomy as part of the Drupal community. Um, and it also gives you a chance to explore sort of topics that you're passionate about. So, you know, whether it's, you know, how to optimize uh, SVG images so that they can, you know, be more accessible or, um, you know, support more advanced use cases for, you know, front end markup, some of those kinds of things. Um, maintaining some of these projects really gives you a chance to, to explore some of the things that you find most interesting. And along the way, you, you get the chance to learn a ton. So, you know, we mentioned at the very beginning about some of the, um, you know, Drupal and, and other certifications that I've done. And, and in particular, the Drupal certifications, I would say, this process of, of working on modules has really been, I would say, key to my own evolution and, you know, career growth um, in terms of learning, you know, how some of the, the deeper use cases of Drupal um, can be satisfied. So I'm just going to take a quick pause here. <clears throat> I'm not seeing any questions in there. Uh, I'll do, do a quick check on the Q&A tab. Looks like we're good. It, try and use the Q&A tab uh, if you can, but um, if you do have a question, but also if you want to um, to post it with like a queue at the front in the chat, then that'll work too, uh, just to make it easier for us to pull those out at the end. So I wanted to talk specifically about this uh, one module I'd worked on called Smart Date and Smart Date, and give you a sense of how some of the things that we've talked about, you know, apply to to its evolution. So it went from being you know, really just an idea about two and a half years ago to being uh, one of the 500 most popular modules on Drupal.org, um, again, in about 18 months. So it, it actually started um, much further back. I had an idea. I was working on a, um, I was working on an events website and realized that the, uh, the process of populating that event content was actually extremely tedious. And so I started to do some thinking around how Drupal could, could follow some of the conventions of popular calendar software, like, you know, Google or Apple Calendar. Um, but really sort of it didn't do a lot with that idea until, until a couple, as I say, a couple of years ago when, uh, when I started to think about, well, how could we make some of those things happen? So I, I started to do some, some of that research. Um, I found some modules and reached out to them. Get a lot of response in that case. There are also a bunch of modules that I, I wish I had found it time and, and probably could have done some more collaborative work instead of um, building as much from scratch as I did. But really, really, there were three key areas that I was hoping to improve. So one was around that editor experience, making it more intuitive and faster to create events within Drupal. Also, by, by using a, a different storage mechanism to make it uh, faster in terms of running queries for events, you know, upcoming dates, uh, events in the past, and those kinds of things. And also um, having an easier way to have more intuitive and almost more natural language formatting of events. So, you know, range deduplication, some of those kinds of things. And so that, that really became the initial basis for that smart date module. And, um, you know, April 3rd, 2019, I created a sandbox project called timestamp ranges. 
Um, started having some discussions with other people I knew in the community, I eventually start settled on the smart date name. And then the next day created that first release of code and started to sort of iterate on that over time, had some beta releases until I decided that it was really uh, strong enough and saw to start to um, promote it a little bit. So wrote a blog and was actually able to get that into the weekly drop. And then started trying to, to keep moving that towards a stable release, realized that the approach that we had been using for getting the um, output configuration um, done, while it was functional, it wasn't translatable. And that was something that was important to me. And so we ended up having to, to create custom config entities for that, which was a fairly significant piece of work, but I think has, has really helped in terms of the, the overall adoption because some of the, the most active contributors to the project uh, over time have been, you know, from people overseas in places like, you know, uh, Germany and, and other European countries. And I think part of uh, um, enthusiasm for it is the fact that it's able to, um, to offer robust support for, you know, a variety of different formatting approaches. Um, so eventually we got to that stable release and then started to do kind of uh, updated versions to, to add some of those additional features. And the big one that, that I had wanted to do for a while was to uh, support recurring dates. So um, after a few months, was able to, to do a major release that offered recurring dates, major release because it had some you know, um, changes that were uh, breaking backward compatibility, uh, also offered support for things like time zone, and then over time added additional features for you know, calendar support, able to support core date field, making it look better in different admin themes. And then going into this year, making some improvements in terms of the overall markup, having a draft script to migrate values from some of those core people might be using already. And the change this year has been um, creating support for a date augmenter API. And essentially that's because the way the formatters work in Drupal, you can use a formatter that might be highly optimized to, to do things like the you know date range deduplication we had talked about, or you could do something, use a formatter that would do things like add to calendar links, but there really wasn't a way to, to make those two um, kind of plugins work together. You had to choose one or the other. And so this idea is to, to offer um, almost like a, a deeper level set of plugins so that you can, as a site builder, assemble the functionality that you need. You can, you can start to put some of those elements together. So I'm actually going to be giving a talk at the San Francisco Drupal users group uh, December 9th, if you're interested in hearing about some of those more advanced use cases. So in terms of the, the keys to success for smart, I really feel like it was, um, it started by some fairly common problems in the Drupal community. Um, also in terms of the development really tried to extend core code wherever possible. So um, if you look at the, a lot of the original pieces in SmartDate were really extending the core uh, daytime field elements uh, and plugins, as well as using some uh, core sort of services and methods for translating between timestamps and Drupal daytime objects. Um, also tried to, to offer both tools and solutions. So I would say SmartDate itself is really more of a tool because it's a, a site building tool. Whereas I was able to release these uh, smart date starter kit and smart date calendar kit as, as solutions, because they're modules that someone who is maybe new to Drupal and wants to try it out, or even starting to build a site and just wants um, to get the, an event system built up faster, they can install the smart date calendar kit and have uh, something set up and, and ready to, it's not necessarily, you know, like uh, complete, they have the ability to sort of, you know, um, add additional fields and additional functionality. As I mentioned before, we've had some amazing community contributions, um, in particular, some of the drag and drop functionality within the full calendar view integration is uh, really provided by one of the, um, the maintainers out of Germany and, and really tried to, to make, um, you know, keeping up to date with the maintainership a focus. And so, um, you know, listen to, to some of that feedback in terms of the features that users wanted. Sometimes um, there were things that, that maybe seemed a little bit like an edge case to me, but, but maybe they were actually not that hard to implement and, and might actually be kind of an interesting programming exercise to, to just sort of see 
how easy it would be to, to add that uh, support for their use case. And then finally, as we talked about, some uh, be able to promote the module, uh, wrote some blogs for it, got some of them into the weekly draw, and then doing you know various presentations like this one, um, managed to do a talk at uh, DrupalCon um, back in April. And so, um, yeah, again, being part of the community and, um, and trying to help out as much as I could. So there's a page here of additional resources um, you can go through and um, see if uh, some of these help you in your own path to creating your module. And um, so with that, I will open it up for questions. It looks like there might be a question in here. Thoughts on finding time bandwidth to maintain modules, fear of fatigue, neglect is the biggest holdup. And I've been remiss on just following up on a feature request to one of your modules. Um, I mean, that's that's definitely a, uh, a fair question and, and a fair consideration. I will say in the the push that I made to to get that first stable release of smart date, um, I had in my head, you know, sort of a, a time frame within which I, I just wanted to get it done and uh, and probably pushed myself a little hard and uh, was, I think, on the verge of, of burnout once or twice there. Um, so. I would say definitely try to to still maintain that that work life balance. Um, for myself, you know, I, I kind of find like I enjoy working on some of these modules as um, particularly if, if I'm not doing it for things that directly support work projects. Then then to me it, it does feel a bit like recreation. So you know instead of playing like Sudoku on my phone or something like that. Um, sometimes I'll just think about, you know, how could I add this feature to the, to that module? Um, I've also heard the, the most recent, uh, talking Drupal podcast. They talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of these questions around when, when to find the time. And I think one of the suggestions was, you know, maybe, maybe try and start your day a half hour sooner and, you know, go through the issue queues and, and do some triaging every day, or, or maybe, you know, Mondays are when you triage your issues and then, you know, Tuesdays you, um, you know, actually try and get some bug fixes written or something like that. I mean, I feel like there's, there's maybe not one answer that's going to work for everybody, but, but maybe just try some different approaches. Um, maybe give it a bit of a structure in terms of, of trying to, um, make the time is, is better than, you know, just, um, trying to sort of like get to it when you get to it. So, um, hopefully there's something in there. Max, that is going to um, to help you in terms of uh, finding the time yourself. And uh, Ryan Kowalski asks, are you are you familiar with the recurring events module? Is Smart Date different? So I am um, familiar with the recurring events module. Um, I have actually with um, the maintainer of that module, and in particular, let me just back up here a little bit. Um, so this Date Augmenter API is something that I actually um, had some conversations with the, the maintainer of recurring events because I really wanted this to be something that was not specific to smart date but but could um, be used by other you know date related modules within kind of the, the Drupal um, date management uh, ecosystem and so um, there are I believe these will work it, you because you can use um, the smart date formatter with, I think it's the, the recurring events instance, uh, basically uses a core date field. You can use the smart date uh, formatter with that, which means you can use all of these, um, these pieces in there. Um, smart date is different from recurring events. I would say recurring events um, is really sort of designed and built for registration. Um, that uh, smart date doesn't really have as much support for. But um, smart date is probably um, probably has a broader set of use cases. So there are things like time zones that I don't think, uh, or at least last time I heard, recurring events didn't uh, support yet. So you know there are uh, there are definitely different strengths I would say to the two modules. Um, probably would want to take that offline if uh, if you wanted to get into a deeper discussion on that. So Ryan, hopefully that's. Um, that's helpful in terms of understanding the differences. Um, see, we're uh, getting close to time here. Uh, P 
Peter says, thanks for your talk. What if there is an abandoned D7 module, but you can't commit to being a maintainer? Uh, so if I understand your question, Peter, you're asking um, how can you fix some issues with the module that you want to keep using, um, but you're not sure that you can commit to, um, to sort of continue to be a maintainer over time. I would encourage you to say if if the module really feels like it it um, is not in active development, so maybe it's been you know several years since there's been any kind of a of a new release on the module. Offering any support as a maintainer is better than than no support. So I would say um, if it's something you're passionate about, if you think you can even um, do a little bit of work to sort of nudge it along its you know evolutionary path, if you like, uh, at least get another release out so that um, you know, you can fix some security issues or, um, you know, get some features working a little better. That's better than, than you know, not having any support at all. So um, I would say don't don't think of becoming a maintainer as like a life sentence. Um, you know, I think it's it's understood by by most people that you're going to help as your you know sort of life situation um, allows and um, you know, again, try and try and have some fun with it and and see it as part of sort of a, a conversation and a way of, of collaborating with the rest of the community. So hopefully that helps. Uh, any other questions? So I've got a couple of minutes here. Uh, Kristen says, don't think uh, being a maintainer is a life sentence is a great comment. <laughs> right. Um, all right. Well, I'll leave the um, chat open, but, but thanks everybody for joining us. The, as, it, as far as I know, the events should be shared on the Drupal GovCon YouTube account in short order. So um, again, if you want to um, reach me, you can find me on Twitter or Drupal Slack or just generally in the community as man crews. So uh, thanks everyone. And uh, looking forward to you know, our next conversation.